on October the 22nd, 2003. My name is Lillian Gantzidis. I will be doing the interview. Our veteran today is Buell Wallace Gifford, and his daughter is also with us today, Sandra Gifford. Um, Mr. Gifford, thank you very much for being with us. To start off the <coughs> interview, if you would give us your full name and your date and place of birth. Buell Wallace Gifford, and was born in Conway, Arkansas, June the 19th, 1924. Was um, your family from Arkansas? What was it like? Was that where you grew up? Uh, no, I left there when I was about three years old and went to move to Missouri. My dad and mother were school teachers, mm -hmm. and my dad farmed in on a farm. Um, and so what was it like growing up on a farm? It's hard work, <laughs> but I, I like to farm. I mean, Did you have any siblings? Yeah. Brothers or sisters? No, I had a sister. A sister? What's her name? Vonda Gifford. All right. And tell me your parents' names. Uh, Jesse Gifford and Amby Gifford. Okay. Um, is there anything uh, significant growing up on the farm, going to school, that uh, any stories you'd like to tell us about that? No, not really. My sister was a very smart person, and she's she's unique because that. I can prove it because I have her report card. She graduated from grade school and high school and college as valedictorian of her class and made all straight A's. Uh -huh. She was who's who in American colleges and universities. And I can truthfully say that she's as intelligent wise as anybody I ever know. <laughs> and I, I can say that and my daughter can tell you the same thing. Um, well, tell me something about you going to school. What kind of grades did you make? Well, I am. Uh, I did make three grades the first year I went to school. And when but did you graduate from high school? I graduated when I was 16 years old. What high school did you graduate from? Clarkton High School, Clarkton, Missouri. Um, and did you go uh, to college? No, I took, uh, after I got out of service, I, I, I went to college and got a degree in agriculture, though. Right, well, um, <coughs> then it might be interesting to tell story of who uh, you were named after. Named after Buell Gifford. My, uh, Buell, uh, after Buell, my dad uh, is an orphan boy and he raised him and I was named after him, Buell. Mm -hmm. And tell that story about how he came to live with your father. And oh, mother. my father's first wife died when he was young, well not very young. 37 years old, and my mother was a school teacher. She was only uh, 24 or 5 years old, and uh, he was going to get married, and, and this guy that I'm talking about, his nephew, Buell, he lived with his uh, with his uncle, and he just hated him, and he wanted to come and live with my my dad, and my dad said, well, it wouldn't be fair to my wife, and, and he uh, said, I can't, I can't take you, and he, he went home and cried, all the way home, and he 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 rode a horse. They said and flew the snow about a foot deep for 12 miles and brought him back. He my mother told him if he wants to live with us, you go get him and we'll let raise him. And they went to Conway, Arkansas, and uh, they all he became a teacher. How old was Bill when he uh, was adopted? To you? Twelve twelve years old. Twelve years old. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, and he and he also he he uh, he uh, raised another boy. that is was an orphan. His dad got bit by a dog, and rabies took over and killed him. Um. So at the time of the war, were you um, were you married? No, I I went in service when I was nineteen years old. Dad's yeah, on the mm -hmm. farm yeah, and I I will tell you about the the government uh, took my dad had two farms they took it for a landing strip for the airplanes to f fly in there. Well, tell us about that. Yeah, and they took our farms, and they didn't take us any uh, give us any money or anything. Cut down the trees and cut down the crops. We had no money or nothing, 
and uh, they uh, uh, we have my dad had bought a tractor and he's supposed to pay for it and John Deere tractor and he wrote and told him he didn't have any money and he right then and and they forced him to he's going to have to pay for it and my uncle at that time though that many years later he was a millionaire and he paid that thing off for, for him and my dad they uh, uh, my dad bought the, the outbuildings and a farm, I mean, outbuildings and a house and a barn for $150. And we we moved the thing uh, about four miles away on a, down the road. I mean, three, uh, three, uh, three bedroom house. And so the government just came in and said. Yeah, they, they paid right? off later, yeah. Oh, they did pay off later? Yeah, but we didn't have any money for that. Well, yeah, and it's still there. <laughs> they had, the, strip? yeah. The no, name? it's uh, emergency landing emergency strip. Yeah. Landing strip. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Did they have a name for the landing strip, or is it? No, it's just uh, Malden, Missouri. Uh, the, okay. the the field was at Malden, about ten miles away. Well, I, I was drafted. Uh, Tell me the story about getting drafted. Oh, well, my dad was in real bad health at that time. He worked on a farm, and you know, he didn't have anybody to help him. And I got deferred for a f few months, and then he uh, just said they had to have somebody to, you know, they had no option. They had to take everybody almost, and I was drafted then. When uh, was that? Uh, that was, like I said, uh, in October something. 46, was it? No, not 46. Oh. 42 or 3, 42. I'm not positive. 19, 1942? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so what happened, All right, so you were deferred for a couple of months, and then um, did you go to basic? Yeah, I took basic training in Camp Fannin, Texas. And tell me about basic training. Well, it was 17 weeks of uh, 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 infantry training, fire, firing machine guns, mortars, and all like that. Mm -hmm. um, what was the, um, where did you stay? What were the barracks like? They were good barracks. Do you remember anything specific about them? Well, just a lot of, a lot of uh, beds in there. And <laughs> what was the food like? Food was good. They we we uh, they served twenty thousand people, in in one mess hall, it's different than four sections. And it's real good. I mean, you could you you it's sterile. I mean, they everything was washed and clean every day. I mean, after they eat and mop the floors and all like that. Uh, well, what were these days like? I mean, you had come uh, from a farm, and now you're in the army. You're in the service. Well. What? <laughs> well, it, it was pretty good. Uh, I met a lot of guys there. Uh, I, I slept with a guy one time. I said, "What?" He's an older guy. I said, "What'd you do?" Before he went in, and said, uh, "My name's Tom." He said, "Did you ever see Tom's Peanuts? That's me. That, he owned that place." Uh -huh. Yeah, and another. I made friends with a guy who was a, in uh, Texas. He was older than me quite a bit. He owned a big herd of cattle there, and. Uh, I made friends pretty pretty well. I mean, um, what were the instructors like? They were pretty good. To, Do you remember any instructors? Well, I remember one. of them. He's a little old sergeant, a little uh, not a sergeant, uh, corporal. And he said uh, doing some bayonet practice, and I didn't do it right. And said, "Guys like you is the ones losing this war." <laughs> I, I didn't like that, but I, I I learned to overlook that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after uh, uh, Camp Fannin, Texas, where did you go? I went to uh, Camp Stoneman on the uh, near uh, Richmond, Vir Richmond, California. All right, and For, what were you doing there? What was your I was there? getting ready to go overseas, and I got on a. a, a uh, ship, a brand new ship, and went to 
Hawaiian Islands, un, 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 unescorted. Well, now tell me, um, are you were in the Army. Yeah. Um, what group were you with? The 96th Infantry Division. All right, and what was your infantry training? What were, what were they teaching you? How to shoot and how to bayonet and do karate and how to fire machine guns and how, how to do sur survive and anything you can think of, you know. Was there anything in your training that particularly stood out for you? Well, I tell you, they, all everything they did was, was uh, good, but you it's uh, you have to learn a lot of things yourself. If you, the way they taught me, I thought just land on a strip on a on the beach and you'd be dead in one hour. But if you use your head, you can survive. But if you don't, you ain't gonna last. Mm -hmm. I went through the war, never got a scratch, never got wounded or nothing. Mm -hmm. Hawaii. Yeah. Took six weeks of jungle training. In Hawaii? Yeah. What was that like? What well, it was a ju jungle there. <laughs> we went, to, uh, we met, had a mock landing on uh, Maui. That's oh, a big island there. And uh, you're, you're supposed to not give anybody any uh, in information if they ask what outfit they're in. A lot of people get in, get land there and they get lost, don't give them any information. And there's one guy, he asked me one time, he he got lost and he was an officer and said, "What what uh, what outfit is this?" I said, "It's Company X. What the devil do you care?" He didn't like that and he went and talked to the company commander and said, "You who is that guy over? You've been you've been telling him to keep quiet. He couldn't do anything with about, about me. There. He didn't like it though." <laughs> um, uh, what after Hawaii, where did you head? We went to, we was going to land on late on uh, Jap, Jap, Yap Island, Yap. And they sent some spies in there and the Japanese had left. We, uh, the way we fought then, we island hopping to get to Japan, you know. So we didn't know what to do and they went to the Admiralty Islands, just right below the equator. It's two, two degrees below the uh, the. the uh, uh, soft, uh, closest place on Earth near the sun. We stayed there for two weeks and planned uh, to, visit, uh, to land at, in Leyte in the Philippines mm -hmm. with Mike Arthur. Um, so, uh, so you were uh, supporting General MacArthur then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, did you see combat? Oh, yeah. Tell me about combat. Well, uh, when we went in, uh, I had quite an experience, and they told us to drop your field packs, and we'll bring them on up to you at night. Well, they didn't know it. It's it jungle there, and it rained all the time. They couldn't do it, and we didn't have any food. Only uh, what we well, we didn't have any for five days, really. Five days. We, that's the only time I ever didn't have any food. And uh, they dropped it, parachuted in. They just give you a big spoonful. And that was it. And, uh, well, I know one time we, while I was getting there, to, uh, while I was traveling for the, on the five days, we eat, we ate some field corn, just raw, you know. Just, I mean, you're hungry, you can. And we had just a canteen of water, and when it was gone, we had to dip it out of the mud and that stuff like water, and we had a halzone tablet. You can put it in there and purify it, little wiggle worms and everything. But it was pure, you know. Well, uh, when I went in, I was a, uh, I was a Browning automatic rifleman in combat, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a machine gun. That as far as twenty clips, just pull the trigger and had a belt full of stuff like that, and and uh, that's where I got the silver star here, right here. <clears throat> Can you show us that picture. Yeah. I don't tell on there, and I don't know. Yeah, just sort of. Well, it was. It's in forty-two, uh, three. Nineteen forty-three. Yeah, they've got this wrong. It wasn't three hundred eighty-third infantry. It's three eighty-second. Okay. Well, we have a copy of that. Yeah. 
I uh, I got that for I, the uh, two Jap machine guns uh, uh, trapped her battalion and we couldn't move, and I, I I was the only one who had something to to stop them with, and and I killed those in Jap machine gunners, and uh, we. Uh, Oh, one of, one of the guys in one of the pictures right here was right right here was my weapon carrier. And I ran out of ammunition and there was bullets going all around and they couldn't get him up there. <laughs> he was scared to death. He finally got up there though. There, um, I see five people in the picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is, are you in that picture? I'm in the tallest one in the middle. The guy right beside him. Here's the one that uh, that uh, that uh, weapon carrier, and it's on the end is a is a sergeant too, and he's the one I named my son after. What's his name? Devito, Sergeant Devito. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Jerome. And this one on the left is the one uh, Lavoie that uh, hunted for me for 58 years. He had nightmares about the war. We was fought in the, and this together, and I got to dig in with foxholes and all like well, that. Would this be a good time to tell that, that story? Tell uh, us the story about the fellow searching for you. And oh, you well, that was the that was the end of war. Then you don't want to know about uh, on the. Well, you, you you've talked about him. Just go on and tell us the story. That part part you don't oh, want me, you don't want me to you don't want to talk about Okinawa. Or go back. We'll, to, get, we'll get back. To okay. Him. But okay. You this I, this is how he searched for you. okay. He had been. Searching for me for 58 years, and uh, he uh, he couldn't find me, and he uh, and, and his, he say his, his name again. Lavoie Hale. Lavoie Hale. Tuscaloosa, Alabama. All right. So Mr. Hale has been looking. Yeah. All right. And a funny part about this, uh, my best one of my best friends, we went out to eat that day, and and we was talking about him. I, he liked to drown in the water. He's a little guy. <laughs> I pulled him out. I thought he was kidding, you know, and he he remembered that, I guess. And uh, two hours later, he called me. He says, uh, "Well, he bought his wife a, a, a computer. computer. He didn't know nothing about it." And the guy, one of his friends, said, "You can find anybody you want to on a computer." In 15 minutes, he found it. And he called me up and said, "Did you said uh, did you fight in World War Two?" In a, th a 96 division, I said, "Yeah," and he told me it's 382nd Regiment and all like that. And he told me his, his name, you know, and I knew that was him, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was tickled to death. He had all them nightmares and what he, kind of nightmares? well, about the war. Mm -hmm. But one thing about me is unique. I've never dreamed about anything. I could watch a movie or anything, never dreamed about it. Never, never, never. Well, you have a newspaper in front of you. Yeah. What's that? Why have you got the newspaper? Well. It, it, the article is in in here. About your reunion. Yeah. It's 58 years. Where's that? With Mr. Hale? Yeah, right down here. Here and then this part of it. And it's short. Well, it tells right up here about, well, 58 years. Open it up, though. The article came out on the anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. And this is my father's piece. Well, it's showed on the inside, though. And then also inside. The 58 years looking for him. Reunion after 58 years, veteran finds. This is me right here. That's in front of his house. Mm -hmm. um, what is the date of the paper, and what paper are we looking at? This is the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Friday, June 6, 2003. And this is a picture there in Tuscaloosa. At his house. All right, so who's um, in the picture? Is that you in the middle? Yeah. And Mr. Hale is? Yeah, and that's my daughter over here. All right. Okay, thank you. That's a wonderful story. Wonderful story. And the wonders of computers, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that was a great story. Let's go back to the war. Okay. Um, well, you're, you're in combat in the Philippines, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. 
I got that, the the picture you made right there. I got that. uh, They had a big parade, and there's a bunch of people that was given awards. And uh, before we went to uh, Okinawa, Mm -hmm. and we went to, you want that? What's that? Did you see any casualties? Man, have I seen a casualties? I saw thousands and thousands of them. What was that like? It's horrible. The one thing that I found out that I wanted to emphasize, they brought a lot of volunteers. Some people don't need to be in service. They ain't got the smarts up here. And and to get in, the, some of them is it's officers. One of them, when I first went in, he was a sergeant. I'll never forget it. We hadn't went in very far, and we went into a little hut, and there was three people in there, a man and a woman, and, and a, a, old, uh, a man and a woman and a young girl. And uh, this guy, a friend of mine, said, what are you going to do with this old man? And this sergeant told him, said, get rid of him. He said, don't use no bullet on it, use a bayonet. And he just took the bayonet and ran into him like that. Right, boy, I'll never forget the blood just gushed like that. And that guy, he never forgot that. He never did. I can't believe it. And then another time, and there was a sergeant that did that. That that, uh, that was a uh, there was a, a young, an older woman carrying some uh, clothes on her head, and uh, she. Uh, oh, he killed it. Just shot her because his his buddy had got killed. He had nothing to do with it. And another time, uh, there's a, there's a different story about. This guy was a colonel. I, I know. I, uh, I was right by a foxhole when he was calling, and back to, back behind the lines, they telling him to take that hill up there. He sent three squads out: one squad to kill everyone, and second to kill everyone, and the third one to kill every one of them. And he said, to "This general back the line behind the line said you've got to take that hill at all costs." He says, "I'm not taking the hill at all costs. It's just suicide." And you can court muscle if you want to, but I'm not taking it. And he didn't. They didn't do nothing with him either. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of people that's just not fit to be in service. Mm-hmm. Tell about and, the man that you knew who was supposed to stand guard. Oh, there's a friend of mine that was supposed to stand guard. He was a designer for Ford Motor Company. He's a very brilliant person. Do you remember his name? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. But um, he was supposed to be guarding 8th Army Headquarters. Court, court, Eighth Army headquarters. We'd been back in the rest area for a while, and he he was they had an outdoor theater open, and he went over there to look at that, and they caught him off there. The guards, I mean, somebody checked on him, and they gave a court martial, gave him 99 years in stockade. He was a nice guy, but I'm sure he got he didn't serve it all out. That's they do that for an example when the war is over. It's all over, you know. But that, I mean, they could, there was three, there's, uh, I know there's one four-star general and two three-star generals that he was guarding there. Mm-hmm. Um, are there any other memorable experiences? Well, um, on, uh, on uh, Okinawa, uh, one time we was digging in on a hill on and this Lavoit, he wanted to, he he wanted to dig in holes with me all the time. Three of us would dig in, you know, stand guard and that. And he wanted to dig up on a hill there and I said, No, the artillery will get us. So do and I finally talked him in when we got down below a little bit. And that night where we was digging, the artillery settled it right in there and knocked us all and covered us up with dirt. If we'd been there, it'd kill all three of us. In fact, we got out of it, and I was talking to him. I went back. I said, what happened to the third guy? I didn't even remember who it was. He said he's probably still covered up. <laughs> I don't know, you know. I don't know what happened, what happened to him, you know. I remember that very vividly, though. And also, uh, they uh, we got up to the end of the island, and they started firing these uh, rockets flying boxcars, call them screaming lunars, it's like a siren. It's actually as big as a boxcar coming in the air, projected like that. And and you could outrun them because they, they just come one way, you know, and you could run off the side. But I've got a picture of there. Where's that at? 
this the explosion maybe? No, 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 no. Take it. No, I'm not sure what you're describing. There's a hole. Oh, it's a horrible hole. Well, that, that don't make any difference. Let I'll it look go. for a picture with the hole. While you keep on but anyhow, they... Uh, uh, Are there any of those pictures that you want to show us? There's, you could just go through it and you might discover that one picture with the hole. Well, here's one in the Philippines where there's some casualties. Some of them blowed right half in two. Yeah, that's the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Here's a here's a cemetery on Okinawa. We lost about thirteen thousand people there on our, our and our division. Mm -hmm. We had a general that was killed there too. Do you remember the general's name? Easily, one star general. Mm -hmm. We have uh, I got a picture of him having a right here where they had a. Ceremony there, right on Okinawa. And that's when that's when uh, he had died. This is a ceremony. Yeah, he, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's one of MacArthur signing a peace treaty on the battleship Missouri with the Japanese. And were you on the? Uh, no, is this I wasn't. No, no, I got this from a war correspondent. Okay. This right here is a. Is it a Filipino, and that's a Jap's head right there. He took, he, uh, the Jap took, had him to climb a coconut tree to get him a coconut, and when he was dr drinking the coconut, he took a machete and cut his head off. Mm. And is that a picture you took, or is No, oh. I, I know. Uh -uh. All right. Oh, here's, a, you're going to show that or not? Oh, here's one right here that I... I don't know what I'm going to do in detail. I was, this is an uncle I never seen. He was a real, real intelligent person. He was had a Ph.D. in history, I think. And I wrote this on April 18, 1945, and I never mailed it. I didn't know it, but I had a box that I kept my papers in. And uh, I, not long ago, I looked in there, and I never and hadn't mailed it. And what I figured out, there was, there was an artillery come in, I think, and I said, I'll call you, I'm all, I'll call it call it a day, and I never mailed it. And that was wrote in April 18, 1945. Why don't you read that last wanna, paragraph? Yeah. The last okay. paragraph. Or do you want me to read it? Yeah, you read it. You read it. Okay, it says, I, I'm going to turn and just show you why you read it. Okay. I'll read the last portion of it. The soil is pretty rich here. They grow a lot of cabbage, sweet potatoes, sugar, cane, carrots, and all sorts of vegetables. We've been getting a lot better food here than we did in the Philippines. They have different kinds of foods in the rations that we get than we used to have. The boys all like the new type of rations. We have had donuts several times here on the front. I sure don't see how Germany can hold out over two more weeks. They sure are getting close to Berlin. There is some Japanese mortar shells landing pretty close now, so I guess I'd better get in my foxhole and call it a day, as ever, Wallace. Mm -hmm. I never mailed it. <laughs> Just recently, about two or three months ago, I've had to open that box up and seen that. That's right. Thank you for that. Um, did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, did you write many letters home? Yeah, oh yeah, that's one of the most important things for for soldiers. If, if, if people don't even know anybody, they, if they want to do something for somebody, i never seen anybody that was so depressed when they'd have a mail call because maybe it'd be a month before you'd get any mail and wouldn't have any. And, you know, everybody had a bunch of mail and, some, and they didn't get any. Now, I read, I wrote everybody I knew, my uncles and aunts and, and they kept all the letters I wrote even some of my aunts and all. So that's really important to um, you mentioned at one point that uh, there was five days you didn't go without any um, food. Otherwise did you have any, plenty of supplies? The supplies was there but they couldn't get it up to us, but they finally parachuted it in. What about the rest of the 
Oh, I had, I did all right. Did all right? Yeah, that, I mean, eat out of ten cans, but I didn't get sick or nothing. Mm-hmm. Tell about the time a friend got um, chocolates in the mail. Oh, and one guy got some chocolates on Okinawa and they had worms in it. He's going to throw it away. So he told another guy, I said, don't throw it away. I said, I'll eat it when it gets dark. He did, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. What did you all do to sort of entertain yourselves? I mean, well, when we'd get back in the rest areas, they had uh, they put up outdoor screens. They'd have thousands of them would uh, uh, would be there on setting out and watching. And one time, uh, the Oklahoma, back in the rest area, they had that on a hillside, and we was they were down below, and then something sitting up on the hillside, see that. And uh, it was pretty good about uh, uh, about doing uh, entertainment. A lot of people come through, you know, and uh, a lot of celebrities even. Any celebrities that you remember seeing? Or? Yeah, I seen. Uh, well, I took basic training with Red Skelton. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I seen. Uh, I can't recall right now, but I seen some of them in California. But I know one thing I found out later that they would been, we was planning on after we went to, oh, another thing now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, the blacks and whites were separated in in, uh, in World War II. And uh, we, uh, when the war was over, we got on, I, I got on ship to come back on Christmas Eve day, 1945. And, uh, they put all the sergeants in one place and all the privates and others because they, they had a lot of animosity. They'd kill them, you know. And you they, were a sergeant. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and they had the blacks with us then. Those, but I made friends with a, with a black guy. He was a, a tech, I mean, he was a first sergeant. And I never will forget when I was discharged in Jefferson's Barracks, Missouri, I was, we left there one night. And he was taking me, we was riding in a cab, and the two policemen stopped us and grabbed him and slammed it up against the, 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 he had his uniform on there too, and uh, searched him, and I didn't know what was going on. He finally, I guess we got a lot of mustard not pay about cash, about $400. They was robbing him, you know, but they didn't bother me. But I thought that was a bad thing to do, I mean, to treat them like that, you know. But I know one thing about the uh, uh, what happened uh, was going to happen. We was getting ready to go to go evade Japan when they dropped it, the atomic bomb, and they ha- they had 300 of these big uh, shells that uh, that knock a hole. Man, it's 100 foot deep, and they were going to use them on on the Americans. And they had ev- everybody and their brother. Would, they claimed the first day we'd lose a million people. Of us, a million people. They had everybody that uh, could carry a gun, you know. Japanese did. So this, that bomb saved a lot of lives. It killed a lot of people, but saved a lot of lives. Um, what, when you heard that the bomb had been dropped, where were you? I was on a boat uh, going to, Men- to Mendor Island. And what was the reaction of the people on the boat? Nothing. The reason why it was a guy from Louisiana. He's a big windbag, and he's telling how powerful that. Put it on a bulletin board, and told how many, how much powerful it was, and TNT and all of that. And I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next day, when we landed, why well, they found out, you know, they took all of our guns away from us, and you know, we were to celebrate. And that uh, he's talking about the the, the sergeants uh, in danger. They had a, when we was there, there was a regiment officer there, and they had a guy, I don't know where it was, he had an outdoor toilet, and he strangled four guys while I was there. They call him Mendor Strangler. Mm-hmm. Do you remember anything else about Okinawa? Have you got some pictures? Uh, well, this is, on, yeah, yeah, here's where the, the, uh, some of, oh, one thing about, about the, the Japanese, they, uh, 
they uh, they would at night try to infiltrate through our lines, and they'd take the the civilians and women put them on and put their babies on the back, and and you had to you couldn't tell who was coming to, and they'd you shoot them, and the babies would still be living and stay there and cry all night long. That'd really get on your nerves. They're vicious. No, it's too much. April 15, 1945, Japanese civilians on Okinawa waiting to be taken behind the lines to a civilian stockade. Notice how many of them are wounded and have been bandaged up. A lot of the Japanese civilians were killed and wounded from our artillery barrages and the strafing from our planes. One thing about the Americans, what I, no, regardless of what anybody says, they have superior weapons over the Japanese and they have right now any of the any of the countries. They just something else. They had those P thirty eights, had the five machine guns right in the cone. They'd zap, they'd zero in on one of those Japs and they just flash like that. Down, down. Can you tell about how the Japanese tried to trick the um Oh they they knew the American names they said, John, John, help me, help me, help me, help me, I'm bleeding to death. You didn't dare to get up, you know, or get out. <coughs> and where would they hide? Huh? Where were they hiding? Well, they was out in front. And up in trees? Wouldn't they hide up in the trees? They did on the Philippines. The Philippines. They, they would, they they would, uh, sharpshooters out there. This is a flamethrower right here. They they burn people up and getting them stockade now. That's on the Philippines. And what's it a picture of? Huh? What's it a picture of? A flamethrower getting in behind a stockade. Where are they? Right. Well, is there any? Are there any other stories that you want to tell about your service before we bring you back home? Dad, tell about the. Um, Was it during the Battle of Leyte that the sky just uh, lit up like it was daylight? Oh, yeah. No, not Leyte. On Okinawa, they uh, when we landed there, they was the biggest armada of ships that ever was assembled in the beginning of time. There's over 5,000 of them. But on the way there, something happened that I couldn't hardly believe. We come in there in the dark, and it wasn't very far apart, and we got in a typhoon. It's capsized some of them destroyers, you know. They're real sleek. <coughs> but we had a guy that jumped over, the, I mean, fell over the, the uh, <coughs> ship, and they turned searchlights on to try to find him. And, you know, they could, if they'd been in his uh, ships, the Japanese around there, they'd got us. But that's one thing. But that night, them Japanese suicide planes come in there. <coughs> They were strapped in a in an airplane, and they they were trying to sink ships. They were suicide. They didn't intend to ever come back. But they they had tracer bullets, and I mean it looked like the sky was full of just red bullets. You know, they'd shoot them down. Um, where were you? Were you on a boat during this, or were you on shore? That you were watching this? We was on the shore then. We landed there. Cadena mm -hmm. Airstrip. Strip. <coughs> so you're looking out at the attack happening on these ships that are out there. Yeah. Now you mentioned a typhoon. Was that before or after this? Battle? No, that was before. For you on a ship? Yeah. What was it like to be on a boat in the middle of a typhoon? I was right in the boat bow, lot of that lower deal in a ship. The waves would go plumb over the top of the ship, and uh, you couldn't eat. You'd be seasick. Couldn't eat. Was that as scary as battle? Were you scared yeah. when that was happening? I want. Well, I'll tell you what. After the war, I'll tell you something worse than that, though. 
and the war was over. No, I don't know of anything else to tell now but about the war. I, mean, I can't remember right now what. Have you described uh, why you uh, received the, both the Bronze Star and the Silver Star? Well, no, I told him about the. Silver, yeah, the that? Bronze Star. I was. I carried a guy back. It was had his insides stuck out like that, and I didn't even remember it. And, and this uh, guy I went to see in, in Tuscaloosa, he told me I did it. I don't. It's things I didn't even remember, you know. We got in hand. We got in hand to hand combat, and uh, they stabbed him. I got in. Oh, another thing on Okinawa. They were. No, it was on Okinawa. Yeah, on Okinawa, they were. They were real cruel. They'd sneak up on you. They'd put stuff in their webbing around their their uh, uh, uniform. And they, at one time, I know. We was in a fox hole, in a sox hole, and a guy was standing guard, and a Jap come in there, and he, this guy fired a ammunition, a clip of ammunition in him, and he still, still kept coming and hit him over the head like that, and his inside just fell out like that, right in. That's what you know, it reflexes. You know, they just keep on going. You know. Um, the rescue that you did was that Okinawa or the Philippines? Oh, that was. Uh, Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah. You saw an awful lot of battle on Okinawa. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's a lot lot of lot of a lot of a lot of fighting on there. Um do you recall the day that your service ended? That they said that you came yeah, back home. Well yeah. And I didn't know when they 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 had these magic they call them magic carpet ships. They you know, you go back on those, and you go by your service and your rank and your medals that you won, and that helps you get back faster. You know, they, they had a priority. You, know. and I remember that. Well, do you remember uh, the day you heard that you were headed back? What did that feel? Well, like that day? <laughs> yep, it sure did. And I. I'll never forget when I came back home, uh, I, my dad still lived on a farm, and I, I cut in about 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I told a story in high school one day, and I, I just couldn't, just broke down. Uh, I come to the gate. A, a guy took me, took me there in a cab, and my, uh, and my dad heard a chain rattle on the gate. And he woke up. I just couldn't couldn't take it. I mean, this the emotion, you know. And one of the teachers said, "Well, you've done real good." You know about all the things I talked about one time with a little girl. <laughs> I talked to them about the, what I was doing in the war and all like that, and they asked the dumbest things. You know, I was, the teacher told me, "Just show them everything you got. Don't pull back anything." He says, "Mr. Gifford, what did you do when you had to go to the bathroom?" I said, "You got to dig a hole and get behind a wood somewhere or down behind a hill." <laughs> I thought that was the most unusual thing, though. Huh? Yeah. So when you got back home, did your dad expect you to start working on the farm? Did you work the next day or did he get it? No, it, I don't remember when it was. He wanted me to put all these medals on all like that. And I said, well, you can't put them things on. I said, that's just for, for parade purposes, you know. And, uh, oh, uh, I forgot what I did. But he, uh, well, I, I, I got a, I went to agricultural school and it was like four years. And, so on the GI Bill? Yeah. Um, what school? Clarkton, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you went for four years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and I, at one time, I farmed 400 acres of land. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
I got asthma and had to move back to Arizona. But uh, what was I going to say now? Oh, uh, my best friend there, he farmed uh, as about the same amount that I did. But I, when I sold out and everything, I didn't didn't get very much out of it. I didn't own the land, but I rented it. My dad had two farms. My dad and my uncle had two farms. But this guy, best friend of mine, they went back two years to see him, and he was a millionaire then. He had three. He had three machines that cost half a million dollars a piece. He was always lucky though about I mean, about uh, doing things. Uh, and uh, there's a you talk about somebody a story. Believe it or not. He was a cook in the army. He was a real good cook. He, said, he wouldn't, you know him, didn't you see him? You would never th think he's a good cook. He could make the best cake ever was. He, he got discharged and he, he was in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, he bought a suit of clothes and he cooked in a restaurant. And I guess he paid for the suit 50 cents a week. And he came down to see his uncle, lived about close by where I did. And he he made a, he got on a blind date. He made he had a date with the county judge's daughter. Had never been on a date. She was 18 years old. Was not allowed to go on. Dates. Not allowed to go on dates. He married a girl the first night, and they had the highway patrolling and everybody else. That that's a guy I'm telling. He's a millionaire. It turned out to be a millionaire. And uh, and he raised two two daughters too. They they got along real good. Uh, let's see, how did I do that? <laughs> Somebody, uh, 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 probably from church. Do you think it was from church? Yeah. No, that's your mother, your mother. Huh? Your mother, I, I met her. Your, my cousin introduced me to her. I, I'm not, the, uh, Twelve years ago, well, I lived with her twelve years in, in divorce. Yeah, divorced. and my somebody at church in, introduced me to to my wife now, mm -hmm. and I wish I'd brought her picture. They, I never show you that picture of her when she's young. They, they said she looked like Debbie Reynolds, <laughs> but she's a beautiful woman. Uh, yeah. Well, um, tell me your first wife's name. Ch Charlene. Helen, Helen. Helen. And we, uh, uh, I, she had two, a boy and a girl, and I had a boy and a girl, and and they, you, you live with them until we, uh, you graduated from grade school and they went to college. Mm -hmm. I've got a son that uh, works at Emory. He's a Yale University boy. He's got a PhD. So he got your brains. Yeah, he's 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 smart. <laughs> But my uh, my sister is really smart, and my I have a I have a aunt that taught school for forty eight years. My mother did eighteen. My dad I don't know how many years he did. Mm -hmm. My dad was very intelligent too. Um, let's talk about after um, the war. After um, the war. Yeah, what did you do as a career? You said you had a farm for a while, but then you went to Arizona. What did you do in Arizona? I worked. The Reynolds Aluminum, one of the largest aluminum plant in the world, for 32 years. What did you do for them? You name it, and I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I worked in a department where, well, I could do anything, any part of it. I could have been in the. It was a well-paying job, had good benefits, and I could have been a. I was offered jobs as, as, a, as a foreman, you know, but I didn't want it because. It, they have you have no protection, and you could you know you get in and they slow down and lay lay off. And I worked there 32 years. I worked till they, it's the largest aluminum plant in the world. I worked there when the till they, the, the last piece of metal come out of there. They I worked the there, down. yeah. When, but when it, did they shut the plant down? In 1958. No, no, no 70s. No, not. 78. 78. Uh, but I, I, I worked where they had a, if you worked 20 years, 
they had a guaranteed job for life. If they close it down, I got 70% of my wages for life, and I got a, I've got an insurance policy, and, and I've got a insurance for life. And then if anything happens to my wife, she gets it, gets it as long as she lives. Oh, but I, I'm, I have a lot of. I don't have to worry about layoffs, and it's in the, it's in the, They sold out to Alcoa. They're the largest in the world, but they've got it in a uh, trust fund, and uh, I don't have to worry about job or anything. Mm -hmm. um, prior to the, um, starting the interview, you and I were talking about baseball. Oh. Tell me about your about oh. baseball. In well, I, I, I managed the team in Arizona for 13 years. What's the name of the team? Well, we had different names. I had one that was the Red Sox and one of them was the Cardinals. And the... <clears throat> Uh, it was most of the, it was in a Jewish community, and there were 17 teams there, and and I I won the first place in the, uh, every year that I uh, managed, and I got in second place in the state in tournament in, in 1950 60 what was that 63 63 I went to uh, to uh, Denver Colorado I flew us up there to and played at Larry Air Force Base and played Grand Junction, Colorado. And I beat them and played uh, oh, San Jose and they beat us three to two. What level baseball was that? That was a senior little league. I had a, I had a pitcher that was six foot three, weighed 220 pounds. Boy, he could throw that ball like a bullet. I had birth first baseman. And, I, and this boy that I'm talking about, it's, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> He he played for me too, Kerry. Uh, it's one that works here at Emory. He struck out in a tournament one time. We played seven innings, and he struck out. Uh, let's see, he faced twenty-one people and struck out seventeen. Yeah. And I I lived by a guy when I lived on a farm that uh, played baseball, played for the Cardinals, and my son was a pitcher, and he was just as good as as Gary Blaylock. <clears throat> But I I like to enjoy that more than anything. I like baseball. My hobby, though, big thing is rocks and minerals. You can tell you about that. <laughs> well, um, uh, all of this story has been taking place in Arizona, yet you're in Atlanta now. How did you? Well, get I I because she had a boy and a girl, a little girl, and a, and a boy, and I, my son was here. She's got a little girl. She's 15 years old, smart as a whip. And Pretty as a doll, five, five, nine, five, nine, nine and a half. She could sing high opera. She she sang at Norway in a in a, in a wedding at a thousand years old last summer. What a church it was. The church, yeah. Years old. <laughs> and my daughter, one thing about her, I can't think anything bad to say about her, <laughs> and I can truthfully say that. And she taught in in church in school ever since she was old enough to do it. So uh, being closer to your daughter's family brought you to Atlanta? Yeah, and my son too. Uh -huh. yeah. So they're both here? Yeah, they're, they're so here. When did you move to Atlanta? <coughs> and, uh, I've been here 12 years, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was talking about my hobbies, rocks and minerals. Tell me about your hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> he had to sell furniture when he moved out here in order to... <laughs> well, it cost too much. They weighed too much. I I, uh, I uh, worked at motor a woman's yard one day, and Sandra knows her. She said, "My my wife didn't like them rocks for a long time. Boy, she'd like them now. I can't trade. I used to trade and, and buy and all I got, and she don't want to get rid of any of them now. But uh, she said I dreamed about that you uh, you uh, had a you died, and, you, and they dug a hole, and your wife filled that hole up with rocks. <laughs> I've got, I've got, tw I've got twelve uh, uh, cabinets full of rocks in my basement. Some it's old as thousands of years, millions of years old rocks. I mean, I got that big around a redwood. Not redwood, the rainbow-colored petrified wood from Arizona. 
I've got some green. I got some rare. They, you, they ain't nobody got any more like them. And you, you've shared your collection on many occasions um, oh. with uh, elementary schools in the area. Yeah. I was thinking Thorndike Natural History Museum might like to know about this collection. Would, yes, would love to probably. Uh -huh. I mean, it really, a lot of the pieces are museum. I went. I went one time. At first time I showed you. A, your, you said something about uh, she was in the chem kindergarten teaching, and uh, she said, uh, "Dad, you might bring your rocks there, and they might uh, they might like that." <laughs> and they said, "If they don't like them, they'll just walk away." But they did, and they oh they weren't raved about it. And how many teachers there? Seventeen. Well, I know all of the kindergarten teachers were six or seven classes. Well, uh, well, but the, uh, the whole school, all them teachers wanted to see it. Well, yes, I don't think we had time for the whole school. No, but we set to. it up later, and they, I, all day long I uh, mm -hmm. uh, showed them. I, I put them out, you know, and they go around, and when they got red, they led by 17 buses leaving. They was all right, looking all over the place looking for rocks. Mm -hmm. if I talk uh, where I couldn't even talk. She took over and that little girl that's 15 now, about that tall, she kept pushing, pulling on her daughter's dress. So I got something to say. And his teacher's in there and she says, I got a very important message to say. I've, she had some red socks. They got these red socks down there at Target on sale. <laughs> Christina will never live that one down. <laughs> Yep, yep, it sure did. Yeah, I tell you what, the one thing about it, I mean, they don't like this probably, the, the Marines kill a lot of people because they're glory happy. And I know what I'm talking about because I fought right along the side of them. If they see a machine gun up ahead, they don't call the artillery, they just send the troops in and they got a picture showing them what they got. And they get out of the Army, I mean Marines, they're Marine, that's all. I don't tell, tell everybody I'm a soldier, I'm a soldier. And I've got a guy that's in the Marines now, he's, he's related to her, he's he's just a kid. And I tried to tell him when he was enlisted, that's all he talked about. And he always asking me war stories, and he said, said, boy, you sure got a memory. I said, when I, where I went, You'll never forget. Do you think it's made you a stronger person? Yeah, uh, but I feel sorry for the Marines. Uh, really, they, they, they don't, uh, they're just glory happy. I mean, they, they don't care about people. And I'm not, that's not an opinion, that's a fact. I've seen it. I wouldn't invite nobody to, to get in that. It, they glorify it. Everybody that's been in with them, and they know that, you know. They they move. They get a lot of things done, but the casualties are triple, and it's not necessary. Um, is there anything that you want to add that we haven't covered in the interview? Well, uh, not offhand. This, maybe you can ask something that I didn't think about. I... Uh, I still keep in touch with this guy that I, down in Alabama, though. Mm -hmm. I never knew he thought that much of me, you know. He, when I tell you what, he called me when I got out of service. His mother and dad called me, but I live in Missouri, and he's way down there, you know. And I never, and I lost touch, and and I didn't know. I didn't know he thought that much. Of me. One thing she told about me, he he's always telling his wife, says. Uh, well, who is a guy? He said, well, he's, he's a big guy, but uh, said he didn't cuss. <laughs> I said, well, I got a lot of bad habits. So I asked my wife. She's got a list of bad habits. So cussing and gnawing. Yeah. And that's why she looked him up on the Internet. She said, I wanted to meet a man who never cursed during the night. <laughs>
Mr. Gifford, is there anything else? Is that about it, you think? You got it all on there, haven't you? Uh, it's still running. We're right at an hour, so. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about his wife, though. It's something. Uh, he he um, uh, he met this girl. She was 19, and he was 25. She was a little country girl, I guess. And she wasn't dumb or anything, but she just <laughs> she's very intelligent. But he uh, uh, met her, and and he decided he's going to marry her. And they bought a house, and he uh, she, she, she he gave her some money to pay for the, uh, <laughs> the mortgage. mortgage, and she went out and big bought a big frame, <laughs> picture frame. Picture frame she liked. And he said, he come back, and he said, did you did you pay the 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 uh, the, the house payment? He said, no, I didn't. Why didn't he? So I didn't have the money left. And he he said that's due down. He had to go borrow the money from. From his uh, dad to pay it off, and she's real smart. I mean, she she's just dedicated. She's, uh, she's uh, they said one month that she called over seven hundred people that uh, is lonely, you know, in a church, you know, all over the country, and she's uh, she's cleaned up in Tuscaloosa. She's cleaned up the pornography there she would get a bunch of women to get together and go meet the, the uh, yeah they passed a city ordinance yeah city ordinance to, to clean up things mm -hmm. she's a real nice person uh, real dedicated that sounds wonderful yeah alright is that it yeah that's good enough alright thank you very much I you, I don't know how I turn out and sound I had a um uh uh Stroke about two years ago, and I kind of slur my speech sometimes. Uh, it seems that way to me. We didn't notice it at all.